Hi, this is Anthony Parent of Parent and Parent LLP IRS Medic, and with me is our lead international attorney, Robert Hansen. Thanks for joining me today, Robert. Good to be here. Right on. So we are talking about a tax court decision that came out. This is Robert Toso, Marcella Solomon versus Commissioner. And uh, we thought this was a really, really interesting case um, because the ta- the uh, IRS, I think, gets hoisted by its own petard, and that's always fun to read. Right. Um, and it's a very interesting case because this is what happened. The IRS tried to open up a tax return uh, audit uh, for to get the to get to go back six years, but in order to do that, the IRS has to show that the income that was unreported was was greater than twenty five percent. Right. And in this case, they got hung up because their own complicated rules on passive foreign investment companies sort of put them in a situation where they're trying to argue something to say, hey, your AGI, your adjusted gross income, was substantially unreported. So I think the first thing we need to do is say, what is a PFIC? What's a PFIC to you, Robert? A PFIC, that stands for Passive Foreign Investment Company. Yeah. And for, the I think, the vast majority of people... It's going to be essentially some type of foreign fund, yeah. mutual fund, investment fund. If the word fund is in there, it's probably a PFIC. That's now, right. there are other things that you could potentially do uh, with your own business holdings that could potentially taint them and turn them into a PFIC. But for the, for the most part, think a mutual fund that's, that's right. just not on the U.S. market. PFIC taint is a phrase that gets tossed around many international uh, law practices. Yes. That is the thing. So this is uh, now um, the the PFIX for the most part. You know, when most people think of PFIX, it's more foreign mutual fund. And the reason why is because this law on PFIX was created in 1986. And um, you could read the court's opinion of why the law was passed. And I would say it's a euphemism because the reality is that Wall Street was really, really angry at right. foreign mutual uh, funds because they didn't have the substantial compliance burdens of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Right. So they're offer, be able, able to offer a much better return. So in, in theory. S- in theory, right. It, in theory, and also in practice, it kind of duh, duh, they kind of do. Um, so instead of reforming the SEC to make the uh, U.S. mutual funds competitive globally, like, well, what we'll do is we'll just make these foreign mutual funds less attractive by right. imposing an onerous taxing regime on it. I would say the best way to think of this is like there's two ways to have the tallest building in town. One is to build the tallest. The rest is to knock everybody else down. Pretty much. PFIC is knocking everybody else down. That's what it is. And right. so um, the part of the PFIC nightmare is the complexities to it. And now we're yes. not going to get into all the complexities. We're, we're going to try to keep no. this as simple no. as possible. So the the thing to understand, in order to understand this case, because if you are a tax professional, someone knows something about PFIX or a little bit about PFIX or a little bit about tax, you might be scratching your head because you can't figure this out. You're, you're, you're sort of spinning your wheels trying to say what it is. Why is this court not allowing it? And he clearly had the income that was over 25% of yep. what he originally reported, which is true. Right. But now, so if we look at a, at a 1040, which I have, um, there's a few places that PFIX income comes in. And mm-hmm. it comes in on line 9A. You'll see it there. Um, you'll see it come in on line 21. Um, you could see it coming in there. Um, and then some old software, uh, depending on what it is, what, and some current software will do it. And it's fine if they do it. Uh, we'll put a footnote on the first page saying yeah. PFIC interest uh, or PFIC interest on extra distribution. They'll just put it on line one. Um, but what, where, uh, where our software puts it in is on line 62. Uh, taxes from uh, the interest of um, the undist- uh, of the undistributed earnings, and also, and here's the whole key to the case: mm-hmm. line forty four. Let's go to the videotape. Let's go to the videotape. Here is line forty four, and, and you're going to say, "Okay, now you're going to say, okay, Anthony, you really lost me now." I'm telling you, PFIC income comes on your tax return on line forty four. You know, Anthony, I'm reading line 44, and you know it says it says tax. Yeah, it doesn't say income. It doesn't say income, right? And you would, there's no way this could possibly be right, but it is because the way the convoluted form 8621, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, will calculate it is it is it doesn't adjust your adjusted gross income. Um, there's income that comes from a PFIC that comes in line 44. What kind of income is that? Is that your income from your undistributed earnings from prior years? Excess distributions, uh, 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 and, and right, from, from prior years. From prior years. That's where it comes in. 
So that's exactly the situation that we had um, in this case, uh, the Toso ver uh, Solomon versus Commissioner. They had some substantial PFIC gains. Yeah. Um, and the IRS is trying to audit them for all these years. And they're saying, well, they substantially unreported his income because if we look at it, it's more than 25%. And the argument failed. It fell on its face it because did. the tax court said, guys, let's look at the AGI. The yeah. AGI yeah. is right. And just because you have this kind of convoluted formula that creates a fictitious AGI that doesn't show up anywhere on the return, we're not going to create a whole new definition for you guys. No, no. The court was, was just not going to have it when the service was trying to say, well, look, yes, there are these rules and yes, all this stuff goes on in different years. But if you really look at it, he, what he sold that year was greater than 25%. And the court's like, well, that's nice. But if I look at what the actual statute says, that's not what his AGI is. That's not what his gross income yeah. is for the years. We have these rules for a reason, and you can't have uh, one rule for gross income for the substantive tax uh, administration and another rule for gross income for just statutes of limitations. Yeah. The court wasn't going to hear it. Yeah, and they, they, they got it right. And it was, it was really fun to see that um, because so many times our clients are on the bad, on, uh, bad end of 8621 news. And so oh, yeah. we like it when, when people can get it. Now, the form 8621 is a foreign reporting for, form. Correct. Now, unlike some of the ones like your 8839, uh, your 5471, 3528, 3520, um, the, the 926, there's no $10,000 penalty if you fail to file it. No, none. No. I don't believe the uh, any penalty any for that does not follow the normal international information reporting form penalties that you get for foreign corporations right. and the like. And I would say you know, because eighty six twenty one is incredibly difficult to do, um, that even if they were filed, most of them would probably be deemed substantially incomplete. It's very hard to get it right, and there's people who definitely do, but get them right. Sure, you you it, does. it's it, somebody gets them right. Um, there's people who get them right, but most people don't, and so there'd be a ten thousand dollar penalty there. Right. So there's good. There's no $10,000 penalty for not filing 8621. However, there is something else that happens. If you don't file an 8621, and you might even watch our videos with this, your entire tax return stays open indefinitely, meaning you don't need this, this rule, this, hey, you, you substantially unreported your income by 25%, we're going to open your whole return. We don't care how much you unreported. unreported right. We can audit your entire return because you didn't file this 8621 once required. So you might have seen that. So you might be saying, well, why didn't the IRS just say, well, your 8621 wasn't substantially complete because it probably wasn't. And I don't know if it was originally filed. We don't know. So why isn't this 8621 keeping the entire return open? Why is the IRS forced to go to its standard 25% rule? Well, I believe the court in a... In a in a I, you know, there's there's the famous footnote four, in the right? Footnote, yeah. Uh, but uh, I think in footnote ten, 10 for this footnote one, ten, yep. uh, the court kind of kind of goes through that, doesn't it? Yep. Uh, to say that you know it, that it doesn't toll the statute of limitations, or it doesn't apply for what the higher act uh, for when the higher act was passed back in 2010. Yeah. So the the the, the tax court, and I think this is the first instance. Do you know of an? I, I can't think of another instance where we had a, a tax court or any court. Rule on the applicability of the higher acts open statutes. I can't think of one. I can't think, I can't of, think one. of one. And, and if any any commenters have one, please leave it in the comments. I'd love to love to know. This is the first court case I can think of where a court is is deciding to discussing the higher acts. So what the court decided, and this very well could end up being the entire law. Right. You know, like this is what I would expect everybody to kind of go through. Footnote ten is going to be probably a very popular one. What the what the tax court's opinion was. If the, the statute had to be open when the higher act was passed right. in order for the statute to be open today. Correct. So what happened was that a few of the early years dropped off of the typical things. Yes, you had some 8621s open when the higher act was passed, but you already had those anyways. So the taxpayer did get some assessments, but they right. were able to avoid some of these other ones. Um, due to the IRS's own very convoluted way of addressing PFIX. Yeah. I mean, basically, like what happened? We went, back, in, back in the 80s, we said, look, we need these, we need these rules to address the issue of, of, of PFIC, right? of a foreign mutual fund, essentially, right? Uh, 
And now the service wants to go, but we want to ignore those rules. Yes, you have to go through it all, but we, but we want to ignore it for this particular purpose right now. Uh, and fortunately, the taxpayers prevailed on this. Yeah, that's awesome to see. And, and you know, and congratulations uh, to council. This is Robert Schwartz and Elizabeth uh, Pettit, or Petit, um, for the petitioner. So congratulations to them. A fantastic uh, uh, win. And I think that, you know, the, the tax court really did get this one right. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, the taxpayer didn't win on everything. Um, but still, I think a nice victory overall. And uh, I think that's this is a helpful clarity, at least a starting point for these open statutes. Right. Because I think the thing that we're we're seeing is that so many people who think that they're you know they're trying a lot of people are trying to pull fast ones on the IRS, not realizing that they're leaving statutes open. Um, so that this is really the thing to look out for. If you did have a form fifty four seventy one right. that was open in two thousand and ten, it's still open now. Right. That's right. And you know when we talk to clients and talk to potential. Um, uh, clients and taxpayers about, you know, what kind of disclosure you want to do and what's the scope of the disclosure. You know, there are certain guidelines for what maybe a streamlined filing is or even what an OVDP would say. And they're relatively limited for the number of years. They're mm -hmm. pretty clear on the number of years that they want involved. But sometimes you think, well, maybe we want to go beyond that because maybe you don't want this particular year open because you've got a form that's, that is going to toll the statute of limitation. And it's better to just, you know what, let's get an extra couple of years done Yep. Make sure everything's right and buttoned up and that you know that, okay, now in a couple of years, that year's going to be closed like any other year, yep. like any other uh, taxpayer. Yeah, sometimes we'll go a little bit above and beyond. But I would say this, if you do the streamlined disclosure program, you follow it and you do it to the T, you could have these years open. They're closed now. As far as the IRS is concerned, mm -hmm. if you do one of those programs, all these statutes that could be open and can give you headaches kind of puts it down. And you, what you have to remember also from the IRS perspective is that they have a lot of people to get to. And there's a lot of foreign information returns That's that true. they know. There's a lot of attention. The IRS, uh, the IRS overall audit rate is lower. International rates going up, up, up. They have all these trained OVDP examiners. There's OVTB is ending. So where are they going to go do? They've already started. They're yep. working on these informational returns. And they're really starting to know them inside and out. Ten years ago... The IRS did not have this knowledge of these foreign informational returns. Now their knowledge is just, it's, it's really getting up there. It's really starting to it's, kind of permeate yeah, all the corners of the service. They're, they're really getting there because the penalties are so very significant. Well, I think that's all we should really cover today. That's probably enough passive foreign I would investment so. company uh, uh, yeah, excitement uh, for one day. This is Anthony Parent for Robert Hansen at IRS Medic. Parent and Parent, thanks so much for watching.